Hi everyone, it's Meredith with Soul Navigation, your evolutionary astrologer. Today we've got a really, really big video to do because we're going to talk about Gemini rising and we're going to go into it um, in a way that is much deeper. It's going to be a little bit gritty and a little bit raw. If you are a Gemini rising, this is the place for you. I'm going to tell you some new aspects and angles to Gemini rising that you might not yet know about. I'm also going to talk to you um, about Gemini rising in the shadow side and in the side that hasn't been exposed too often. When you read about Gemini in the books or you look at a lot of the videos, it stays kind of on the, sur on the surface. It stays kind of in the space and the place of Gemini is smart, Gemini is the communicator, right? And it doesn't go into the depths and the core and the soul and the sub- conscious coping mechanism and the why and i like to bring you the why so i also want to invite you at the end of this video please go watch my entire gemini playlist so you can really become sort of fluent in gemini's subconscious language why is gemini the way gemini is so first, I want to go into the psychology of the Ascendant. Now, maybe you've watched my entire Rising Sign series. And by the way, I kind of hope that you have because it is relevant and it is um, profound for everybody because you have every single sign in your chart. And in my Rising Sign series, I go a little bit deeper into the characteristics and the uh, subconscious programming of each sign. So I do recommend that you kind of take some time and binge watch the entire rising sign series. So let's talk about the psychology of the ascendant. And it's important that you understand how important the ascendant actually really is. It is, I think, one of the single most important elements in the chart because it sets up the dynamic of your entire zodiac wheel. Your natal chart will be determined basically by the degree on your rising sign. And that can only be determined by your time of birth. When you know that, you get your rising sign, and then that sets up the cusp to each house. So where do you have Gemini in your chart? Wherever you have Gemini in your chart, whatever house it's in, this is how that particular area of your life will act and react to the world, okay? If you have this in the 11th house, but you have no planets in Gemini, let's say, but let's say Gemini is on the cusp of your 11th house. Well, listen to this video and think about how you work with groups and organizations and friendships and friends. And I will be probably speaking about how you subconsciously deal with friendships and how you are inside of groups and organizations. So, this is especially for if you have Gemini rising, but if you are a Gemini sun sign, you will get so much out of this video. And if you have a moon in Gemini, this is also an imperative video for you. Also, if you've got your Mercury, your Venus, your Mars, or even Jupiter in this sign of Gemini, this video is for you. If you've got primary planets, the moon, Mars, Venus, Mercury in the third house, this video is for you. And also if you have a stellium of any planets, three or more planets in the third house, this video is for you. Welcome to my channel. I am Meredith. I'm an evolutionary astrologer. I've had my own practice for over 20 years. You can learn all about me in the notes below. You can go see my website, learn all about my team here at Team Soul Navigation if you want to get a reading. The psychology of the ascendant is important to understand because it shows you your relationship to the entire world and it is built, if you will, um, during the first 12 years of your life, maybe 14, and maybe even quite possibly up to 16 years old. Yes, many astrologers will call it the mask or your persona. Yes, that is true. That is what it is. But it goes way beyond being your mask, being your facade, and being your persona. It is the marker of what you actually physically look like. It is all of this. It is true. Um, but today we're going to go into it deeper and we're going to explore what does it mean psychologically logically to have Gemini rising. If you are not a Gemini and you don't have any real prominent parts of Gemini in your chart, but you know somebody who is a Gemini, your mother, your father, your child, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your best friend, your aunt, your uncle, your cat, 
this is the psychology of that person. We have to go back to the day that you were born. Your ascendant shows us your birth. It shows us how you came into this world, and then it shows you the entrance into the world, and it also shows how you will show up in the world and how you will show up in every single new beginning, every single first start. So if you've never painted before, it's going to show you the way you'll pick up a paintbrush and paint. If you've never written a book before, it will show you how you'll write a book. If you've never played kickball before, it'll show you how you will show up for the team to go play kickball. It shows us what you look like, and it shows us how the world receives you. It shows us how you ask the world to receive you as well. It shows you what your childhood patterns created for you, if you will. What patterns were created, I should say, in your childhood. And Geminis were children of incessant questioning. They ask the crazy questions like, you know, why do we live in a house? Why didn't we grow wings? Why can't we fly like a bird? Why do we breathe, mommy? Daddy, why do I have, you know, two arms and two legs? You know, why, why did God make butterflies, mom? Dad, where do ants come from? Do ants have a soul? Do bees have a heart, <laughs> right? It's the child that is just the incessant questioner. And because of this incessant questioning and giant curiosity, Geminis are oftentimes like cruelly labeled as a little bit crazy or a little bit whacked out. And it's so not fair to them. And you know, sometimes Geminis are just called flat, just flat out cuckoo. And they, you know, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit into that, but Geminis really represent this youthful, eager energy that just wants to learn and wants to read and wants to write. And at the core, they basically want to learn. They, they want to stay curious about life. They want to understand the way life works. That's their survival mechanism. They have a desire to learn about life and then align with life and adapt to life. They live with inquisition at the core of their soul and their inquisitive minds never stop, never shut off, never turn off, and rarely even slow down. As kids, they are bright, they are witty, they are funny, they are chatty, they are multitaskers, multifaceted. They are the Peter Pan of the Zodiac and they stay very childlike in their energy. I also like to call Geminis and Gemini Risings especially the nimble fountain of youth. These are the people that turn into the grandmother doing splits at age 90 and take yoga classes at age 85 still. You will probably stay forever young if you are a Gemini rising. Gemini risings grow up in an environment that promoted curiosity and learning was absolutely critically important to to their family. They are the reporter, they are the writer, and they become the communicator. These kids probably never shut up. Yeah, they're the ones talking in class. <laughs> Love you, Geminis. Mwah. Language and their voice become their gifts and their talent and their tool. Language is the prioritized tool in their toolbox, and they get this from a young age to use their voice. Now, they also learned at a very early age, growing up, to detach and to develop objectivity. They are not subjective as much as they are analytical and they are objective. They learned at a really young age also. They're kind of, they've got an engineering side to them, how to classify things and how to put things in order. They created the ability to analyze and even sequence data right? Become a programmer or um, put all the blues, all the blue Legos here, all the yellow Legos here, all the red, all the purple, all the green, right? They learned sequencing at a super young age and they probably talked really early. Gemini's as, as a baby and in their formative years has an obsession or a compulsion to learn all about what life has to offer them and to learn all about options and opportunities. They like to understand the multitude of, of opportunities that are available to them. That's where they sort of developed their attachment to having choices and their attachment to diversity. Um, that's where they developed um, uh, the desire to not be 
pinned down to just one thing. They are the sign, Gemini risings, of options, 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 right? They feel quite suffocated when options are taken away from them. Geminis learned from their early childhood the art of detachment from, and they learn this from others. For some reason, they had to learn emotional detachment. Let's dig into this just a little bit deeper. You have to know this about Geminis in order to be involved with your Gemini or in order to be a Gemini and it, to be involved with the Gemini and not get your feelings hurt and to be a Gemini and to understand why people sometimes get their feelings hurt, right? So when the shadow side takes over in Gemini, it's a little bit rough. It's like almost a split personality in a way. And this is the detachment. While you see them present with you inside this conversation and this dialogue, you feel them at the same exact time a little bit missing. You feel this, this vacancy a little bit. You feel them somewhere else while they're standing right here with you on this train track talking to you. Trust me, they feel this too. They're just used to it, but you're not. And it's easy to get your feelings hurt. Um, they learn how to adapt to the external world while they hide their deeper, more internal world. They hide that. So they're living in two spaces. What's going on in here? and then what's going on out there. They develop a persona, a mask, a coping mechanism that um, is very astute and very smart. And because it can split and fraction itself off, I should say fracture itself from itself and be sort of in two places at one time. And because they have this amazing curiosity, Geminis learn to become externally, socially, and culturally and even aesthetically very, very aware. They're astute. They learn how to multitask as a survival mechanism, but they learn how to maneuver in and out of all kinds of environments. They learn, and remember the word learn, okay? Because that is their middle name. That is their core value. To become nimble and to become agile and they learn this at a very young age, how to manage, how to handle, and how to talk to all different kinds of people, all different types of groups, all different kinds of organizations. They can talk to different tribes, different classes of people, different cultures, different kinds of people, all walks of life at a very, very young age. They've mastered the art of communication to all people. Their environments required of them to understand cultural diversity, communicative diversity. Um, they learned how to have poise and have certain kind of mannerisms, how to fit into subcultures and, and groups that are different from themselves. And they do this to survive and they're good at it. They've come to master variety. And I noticed that a lot of people don't talk about them that way, but they are here to understand, work with, and master the concept of differences and varieties. Geminis can oftentimes understand the outer world's expectations of them, and they can become a mimic. They're great. That's why they're great at languages, and they can do impersonations really easily too. They can become a mimic or a copycat in a way. Um, just doing what they learn, doing what was taught was is right and wrong and good, all while hiding what they really feel on the inside or not even truly being in touch with their own preference. So this is how they have sort of a split personality. And this can actually be how they detach or even worse, how they don't even know what their own preference is. Sometimes they don't really have an ability to get in touch with what their genuine choice is. And instead, they just sit in conversation with you, mimicking what they believe is the etiquette of that group or what is the desire or what is the opinion of that group when they're sitting face to face with you. Like all air signs, they become a reflection of you. And 
so to your face, you see this highly communicative, highly adaptable, very versatile, very smart, astute person embodying the idea or the concept or the values that the two of you are sharing, all while their true identity is a little bit lost, scattered, disengaged, or at worst, even unknown to them. You know, Geminis oftentimes especially in their formative years. Now, as they get older, they research this more and they undo this They undo this in themselves, usually after the age of 36. But if you're a young Gemini and you just feel like you're a little bit lost or you're a little bit scattered or you don't know exactly what you want or where you want to go, it's okay. It's okay. This is common. This is, this is how you're programmed. And you're like a mosaic collecting those tile pieces, collecting those tile pieces to create a larger story. Um, and in, in time, this will probably sort itself out, especially if you want it to. It's common for Geminis, Gemini rising, Gemini moon, Gemini Venus, packed third houses to not know what their truthful opinion is because they prefer the reason why this happens is because they prefer they're more comfortable living in the questions and the curiosities of life rather than living in the definitive answers and the definitive black and white opinions. They prefer to live in the curiosity. You know, at the saddest level, they don't know who they really are in a definitive way because they're always changing their opinions and living in the variety of who they could be, who they might be, who they want to be, who they once were, who, right? And at the sadder level, they're a lost soul. And then at the very, very saddest level, so the Gemini that is just so wounded and so broken, they feel literally like the lost soul, but the lost soul that will never be found, just kind of like space dust. So try that feeling on. Really go into that. That is how a Gemini can feel at that rock bottom level. Tell me if you can relate to this. Tell me if this is how you felt younger. Tell me if you've overcome this. What helped you overcome this if you no longer feel this way? But leave your story if you don't mind so other Geminis can learn and grow from you. I do feel like I have a good concept of Gemini. And that is sometimes I think Geminis are a little bit afraid of endings because endings are final answers. And Gemini is exploratory, and it's in the curiosity, the possibility to explore that they feel the most fulfilled and the most comfortable. And they prefer options over resolutions. They don't love finite things unless it's a math equation or a numbers problem, but they always need an option of having the escape hatch open to them. They will feel suffocated. So hopefully they find partners and, and build families that can grow with them, who are not frustrated by variety and trying on all kinds of different things. And Gemini is in its shadow side, underdeveloped, undeveloped, or if they've been severely beaten down in their formative years and they don't come with the self-esteem or self-confidence that they need to survive their world, what happens is, is they detach emotionally and they become so detached from their own internal emotional world that they don't actually even know what they want for themselves or for their lives. And that that lonely feeling is so unbearable that what they do is they go on a quest to learn everything about life to keep emotional feelings at bay, to live in the mind instead of the heart. The heart is where the pain lives. And so they like to keep the pain at bay by over-investing in the mental processes of life. They go into their minds and this is why they overdevelop their thinking and their learning singing or playing the piano or learning music or learning language um, and learning how to talk and communicate. And they are 
oftentimes like unbearably incessant talkers, Gemini risings especially, not always Geminis, but Gemini risings are usually incessant talkers, especially if they've got their Mercury in an outgoing house. Like if they have their Mercury in the ninth house, oh, yeah, 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 they probably don't shut up. If they have their Mercury in uh, the third house, they probably also don't sh shut up. If they have it in the seventh house, they're probably giant talkers too, because then they're well, and if they have their, if they have Gemini in the seventh house, like if they have uh, their Mercury in the seventh house, that means, um, yeah, they're going to be Sagittarius rising. So they're probably incessant talkers. So if they have an extroverted chart, you know, if they've got a lot of Scorpio and Cancer and Virgo, they might be more shy. But um, most Geminis I know are big, big thinkers and big, big talkers. Um, my dad was a Gemini and I would not say that he was a big uh, talker, but he had a lot of Pisces and a lot of Cancer in his chart and he had Pluto on the Ascendant. So that kind of kept him sort of like, uh, he had big thoughts and you could always see his mind overworking, but you had to work a little bit to get him to talk. However, he was a beautiful beautiful, beautiful communicator. Um, and he could hold dinner parties of 20 people and talk and tell stories. He was a great storyteller. But I wouldn't say that he was an incessant talker. Definitely incessant reader and an incessant learner. So I want you just to think about your, your Geminis. But they talk to keep the emotions at bay. If you think about it, talking and thinking and analyzing and learning is a brain muscle. And their brain muscles are big. They're brain muscles keep the heart from bubbling up all that emotional messy you know feelings and those messy emotions that can't be sequenced that can't be organized that can't be analyzed and or they can't be measured very easily they can overtake you right and they don't like that gemini's are masters at keeping emotions detached and in a separate box way over there outside of the body like they wrap their heart up in a big old box and they just stuff it under the bed and they pull it out only once in a while when they need it when it's required not very often this heart thing with a bunch of ooey gooey gooey emotions you know is not meant it they they feel it doesn't serve them as well as their mind does and they feel like it only serves them on occasion the sad thing is is it's not until gemini understands that they need to synthesize both and connect both that they can create a truly fulfilling life you a gemini that values both head and heart what got you there how did you get there are you a Gemini that cries easily? Do you have a Cancer moon? <laughs> That's my first question. Like what keeps you tender if you are a tender-hearted Gemini, if you cry easily, if you feel deeply? You know, do you, what aspects do you have in your chart to the moon? What sign is your sun sign, right? If you're a Gemini rising, I wanna know share with us. Now, I want to tell you, this doesn't mean that Geminis don't have a heart or Geminis don't have emotions. They do. And they have big feelings. They do. That's the whole point of keeping them detached and over there because they're too big to deal with. It's just detachment creates a couple of things, efficiency and speed. And efficiency and speed are two of Gemini's most favorite things. And remember, I am mostly talking about Gemini rising in this video. So every time I say Gemini, I want you to think of Gemini moon, Gemini Mars, Gemini Venus, Yes, you can all relate to this Gemini sun, third house stellium, third house primary planets. If you have your sun and your moon in Sagittarius, but it's in the third house, this is for you. Or, um, you know, if you have Gemini Jupiter, this could really be a big thing in your chart too. But this is predominantly Gemini rising. The reason why Geminis are so attached to efficiency and speed is because we can't move quickly through all the things that life, you know, has for us to explore. If we're like, slow as a, you know, Taurus. We can't get through everything we need to get through. I mean, we're here in one lifetime and Geminis are very aware. They're very aware, probably the most aware, maybe Sagittarius is second, on how much there is to do in the world. And I got to get it all done. Do you realize I got to live 22 lifetimes just in this lifetime and all those sticky, icky emotions that are so big and so deep and so dark and they're going to have me plod through like mud uh, or quicksand. I'm going to sink. I don't have time for that. I got to live 22 lifetimes between now and tomorrow morning at nine. I'm a Gemini. I'm a Gemini rising, right? So Geminis learn 
that they want to process emotions very fast. Um, and emotions slow us down. Emotions have us slog through the quicksand or the mud. And so it's really going to slow me down. And I don't have time for that. So I want to process emotions fast. I don't want to go too deep. I don't want to get sticky. You know, emotions are like the, uh, the, the sticky paper for mosquitoes, like, you know, the fly paper. That's what it's called. Yeah. That's what emotions feel like to Gemini's a lot. It doesn't mean they don't have them. It's just that it takes really slowing them down to want to talk about them, go into them, discover them. And one thing that I notice is if you, if you enter the head to get through the heart, like let's really understand where you're coming from. They can go there. But if you're just going to dump a bunch of emotions out like a puzzle, no. I should say, if you're just going to dump out a bunch of emotions like soup on the floor, nope, they're not interested. It's like, clean up aisle 10. Yeah, they're not interested. But if you go into emotions in a real logical way, like, talk to me about why you feel this way. They will analyze their emotions, and they're pretty damn smart about them too. But you have to enter through the mind. So... Geminis are oftentimes overwhelmed. You'll notice this when you talk to them. And it's because, like I told you before, like Sagittarius, they understand the vastness of every single thing. If we're going to talk about, I don't know, um, flowers, well, think of the 82 million different things you could talk about flowers, the variety, how they grow, what kind of soil, minerals they need, what they need, you know, how many can you plant? Like it goes on for endless, endless, endless information, right? So they understand this vastness and that's why they get overwhelmed because, I don't know, they see the labyrinth or the rabbit hole or the black abyss in every conversation, every idea of life. Let's talk about Geminis and how they got this way, okay? Because this is really important and this is their early childhood. So in their formative years, Gemini Risings often grew up in a family that encouraged big learning and they came from parents who believed in being smart and who believed in cultural diversity, probably. And they believed in a little bit of experimentation. Tell me if that's true, Geminis. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Tell me if your parents were a little bit experimental, experimental with different things like education. Like, hey, let's try Montessori school. Hey, let's try homeschooling. Hey, let's try this kind of food. Hey, has anybody ever eaten octopus or squid? You know, you were probably trying things that other kids weren't necessarily trying. So, you know, hey, let's have an open marriage. Hey, let's be real about what marriage is. We don't need to sign a piece of paper. Let's be two people in love and just create a union. You know, hey, let's visit the science center and hey, let's learn. So this is the kind of environment that Geminis oftentimes grew up in. And they also probably grew up where the parents were a little bit more willing to show flaws. Not saying the parents wanted to, but there is something about wanting kids to learn objectively and see things for what they really are. They are oftentimes exposed to things that other kids are not. And they can grow up in, Gemini Risings especially, can grow up in kind of unconventional circumstances. You know, maybe they grew up in a van traveling cross country, or like I said, being homeschooled in the van, or maybe not. But I'm just saying that there oftentimes is also a, a mobility or a changeability um, in, in, their, in their home life. Sometimes they're even exposed to um, I mean, forgive me for this, but they're exposed to their parents, you know, drinking excessively or partying excessively or smoking pot before smoking pot was legal or, you know, and, and it's like these parents probably gave a little bit more wiggle room to letting their flaws or their differences um, be known. If you are a Gemini, I really, or if you have a lot of Gemini in your chart, I really recommend you go to my shop at soulnavigation.com and buy the starter package if you haven't already and get your natal chart and start exploring astrology. It is so deep. It is so real. And if you already have your starter package, get my advanced astro gold package. You will love it. And it will show you the rulers of every single um, sign on each of your house cusps. It is so deep. And you get two reports 
in that um, Pleasure Progress chart in my advanced Astro Gold package. It is absolutely mind blowing. It is amazing. It's amazing. Just so good. You'll love it. You'll learn so much. And I just found that peeling the astrological onion is so worth it. God, how I wish I knew this stuff at 14 years old. It would have saved me. Instead, I slogged through life not understanding why, oh, why I am the way that I am. And I wished somebody would have helped me develop a deeper appreciation of myself at an earlier age. But I didn't know anybody who studied astrology. I didn't know anybody. I didn't learn astrology until I was in my 20s. And I'm so sad about it. So I love sitting here, passing the torch on to you and helping you go a little bit deeper into astrology. So I really recommend go get one of my reports in, in my shop at Soul Navigation. You'll love it. So one thing that I noticed in my studies and in my client sessions is that Gemini Risings, the family oftentimes either live abroad or they might even be cross-cultural. Um, so they might spend, you know, lots of times uh, vacationing or living or having a second home in a place that is different than their primary home. Um, you know, even if it's something like, you know, for my American viewers, let's say you uh, grew up in in Los Angeles, but you might have had a, a second home, say, in off the coast of Boston or Massachusetts, which is a totally different kind of culture than LA culture, right? Or Costa Rica or Italy or France or Asia or a family that visited um, regularly from India or there's two languages going on. But there's oftentimes cross-cultural diversity inside this family. It could also be mother and father have um, different cultural backgrounds. Like I've told many of my people, and if you guys are a super supporter, I love you. I love you. I love you. If you're not, consider being one for 25 cents a day because I have a whole nother library of videos where I go deeper. But one of the things I talk about a lot is my Gemini father um, married a, a woman later in life when I was an adult to a Thai woman. And his background is German and her background is Thai. And so my brother and sister are half German ancestry and half and, and half Thai and grew up in Thailand and Cambodia. Um, and I spent a lot of time there too. I spent 10 summers in Thailand. And so I have a Gemini dad, right? So there you go. And so this is quite, quite common. So tell me if this is the case with you too. Did you grow up with a cultural diversity? There is also sometimes now we're learning that there's more and more of this, not only cross-cultural, but cross-gender, um, oftentimes two moms or two same-sex parents, two dads. There's oftentimes um, a sense of easygoingness with you know, with Gemini Rising's parents or Gemini's parents, the Gemini Rising or the strong Gemini person usually experiences their parent kind of as a friend, not so much as an authority. And Gemini's and Gemini Rising's can feel a little bit like their parent is absent and or there's an absence of, on a darker side, um, there's an absence of deep emotional care or there's an absence of protectiveness from the parent. Like the parent isn't some pit bull that's like, hey, where were you? You know, where have you been? Uh, I don't want you walking late at night. I don't want you riding your bike, you know? And so the child of the Gemini or Gemini rising can be like, hey, I'm out here in the dark playing in the street. Does my parent even care? You know, does my mom even know? Does my dad even know? And so they can feel sometimes like this is there's a lack of parenting and that their their parent is more of a friend parent rather than a parent parent. Tell me, Geminis and Gemini Risings and Gemini Moons, did you feel that, that your parents gave you a little more like leeway and a little less protectiveness than maybe what you secretly craved? I know there's a cool factor to that and I know that we really appreciate that and, and I know that we appreciate it when our parents like really trust us. Like, But it seems sometimes like are you really trusting me or are you just like not caring? I'm not positive. And the message is twofold and the message gets mixed up in the little kid's mind. At seven years old, you might think it's cool, but reflecting back to it, you might feel like, hmm, I don't get it. Hmm. You know, my parents don't even know where I'm at or what I'm doing or who I'm doing, <laughs> who I'm doing, what I'm doing, where I'm doing it. 
And this can be a double-edged sword for the child. Like it's cool, but the kid also craves this concern and this like, I want dad to want to protect me. I want dad to be my bodyguard. I want dad to kind of, you know, when my first boyfriend shows up, give him a little bit of a hard time. Make sure, check him out for me, right? Don't just let me go be with whoever I want to be with. Yeah. And kids secretly crave and need and want direction. They want an authority figure growing up that makes them feel emotionally secure, emotionally safe, emotionally connected, and emotionally bonded to. Gemini risings also come from an environment where the parents are over attached to other people outside their home. And they can even see or witness their parents sort of gossiping or chronically measuring themselves around other people's knowledge and other people's successes. The dad often has a really big or an important or a valuable social network that he benefits from or the family benefits from. He could even be just like a life insurance salesman, but oh my God, he's got a client everywhere and he's off playing golf and having the two martini drink. But it's usually dad who has the social network, but sometimes it can be mom or sometimes it can be whoever raised you. So whatever, you know, if you were raised in a foster home or something, it would be the person who influenced you and shaped your first 12, 14, 16 years. And then I'll tell you that when this is dysfunctional, sometimes this network of, of, of friends or this important work network or this network of people sometimes is prioritized over the child over and over again. And again, the child realizes, wow, I need to be, you know, emotionally astute. I need to be able to like handle this network. Um, I need to be able to operate inside this cool network of people. I, I don't want to look stupid or dumb um, or unaware inside this network. I better be something, right? And so the child raises itself up to match that network's expectations. And again, that's external programming. Even though the child feels like, wow, I, I wish my dad, I wish my mom, I wish this authority just took as big of an interest or I wish I was as interesting as dad's network, as dad's outside influence. Um, and sometimes the child is left just craving that attention but they realize that the the authority figure, the parent is just too busy to juggle it all. And so the parent feels absent to the child. The parent, the, the parent starts to feel vacant to the child. And the child feels like, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to bother this person. And so the child learns to detach from its emotional neediness to father or to the parent. Now, is it real neediness? No, it's not. But that's how the Gemini rising child starts to get programmed feeling as if their needs are needy. Did you hear that? So the Gemini child feels an aversion to being needy because the mere fact is they just have an emotional need. Yeah. So oftentimes the Gemini parent can be idolized in a way because they only get a sprinkling of attention. Um, and so they crave it and they just cherish it. The child does um, because it just feels so good to get that attention. So they learn to mimic this and they learn that they need to cut this part off in order to uh, fit in, get attention, get a conversation, get some time. And children learn by the messaging of their parents. And then they, they start to mimic the parents. And so this starts to erode or remove the emotional world and the importance of emotions for the Gemini, the Gemini rising. It's too heavy, it's too burdensome, and it slows down the parent and then the child when the child becomes older. It starts to slow them down. And the emotional weight of the kid, the child knows, is too heavy for that busy parent. And so they manage their emotions away. They keep it detached and they keep it on the inside. So they are not emotionally heavy. Gemini's like light things. They're light on their feet. They like things quick, fast, light. They don't like heavy things. 
especially emotions. So the kid learns to lighten up. That's why Geminis represent the fountain of youth and the lighter side. If you guys want to learn more about this, book a reading at soulnavigation.com. Just click on book a reading and then you can see my entire team and everybody on my team can do a brilliant astrology reading for you. You can book a reading with me. You can book a reading with anybody at Team Soul Navigation. They are so smart. So, so, so smart. You will love it. You will love it. It's worth every penny. And if you're a super supporter, you get a discount. So go check it out in the notes below. Gemini rising celebrities. Okay. Look at Lady Gaga. She's a Gemini rising and you can see it and look at how her voice and her communication is her gift. It's true. But her entire childhood was plagued with mental illness and she's open about it. And she had a very, very challenging childhood. Um, Drew Barrymore, she's very interesting. You know, she came, she, she's Gemini rising and she was placed in rehab at the age of 13 and she spent 18 months in an institution for the mentally ill. And she talks about it openly. She also attempted suicide at 14 and she was put in rehab after that again. And then after, um, after that, she stayed with David Crosby and his wife and because she needed to be around people who were committed to the life of sobriety. She later described her life in this autobiography of, of her book called Little Girl Lost. Remember I told you Geminis at their rock bottom feel like the lost soul? She actually emancipated herself at 15 years old from her parents. Talk about detachment, right? Total detachment at 15. And she went and lived in an apartment. And not every Gemini rising, you know, has um, detachment from cruelty. You know, um, in, in, in my life, I didn't have detachment from cruelty. It's just that my father's job with the UN took him overseas and my my mom and dad couldn't make uh, a marriage work. My mom had a massive career in her own right. She was so successful, became a PhD in her own field and um, needed to plant roots. And my dad's roots were more varietal, right? Variety, He his job made him move. Um, and so it didn't come from cruelty. So detachment isn't always coming from cruelty. Um, for my brother and sister, emotional detachment came from his death. So there was nobody there, right? So it's not always steeped in cruelty. Look at Sandra Bullock. So her father was um, in charge of the Army's military post, post office in Europe, in Nuremberg. And that's when he met Sandra Bullock's mother and her parents married in Germany. And her grandfather was a German rocket scientist. I thought that was interesting. And then remember that movie she did with George Clooney, Brad Pitt, can't remember, but it was that outer space movie. I thought that was interesting. Her, her grandfather was a, a rocket scientist. And so for 12 years, Sandra Bullock spoke German her first 12 years and grew up in Nuremberg, Germany. And she lived in Vienna and Salzburg, Austria too. And she, she grew up speaking German and there you go, her voice, her acting, bilingual, right? And as a child, her mom went on to European opera tours. And then Sandra was detached from mother when her mom went on opera tours and was raised by her aunt and her cousin. So there's the detachment. And I think Sandra Bullock <clears throat> is a really healthy human being and well, well adjusted. And she was obviously loved and cared for. And she got a rich, 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 highly intelligent background, freaking rocket scientist, grandfather, mother on opera tours. You know, that, that's no small thing. I'm pretty sure the mother was singing opera in multiple languages because operas are spoken in Italian and French and uh, English. Let's look at Amy Winehouse, Gemini Rising. You know, her father confessed that he believed his extramarital affair ruined her whole entire childhood and made him unavailable to his daughter. And he said that um, he admits that his daughter's early life uh, difficulties were because he cheated on his, her mother, Janice, for over eight years. Um, and then he left at like eight years or so, he left after eight years of cheating on her. He left, he left, he left her, he left Amy, he left his 
wife Janice to go live with his mistress Jane. And he thinks that that's what destroyed Amy's life. Let's talk about one more, Pamela Anderson. She's really uh, an interesting soul. And I think Pamela Anderson has a beautiful soul on the inside. But she says, quote, I did not have an easy childhood. Despite loving parents, I was molested at age six by a female babysitter. And she came, she came out and talked about it. But she, she's also talked about her dad was an alcoholic and her mother worked two jobs and tried so hard, but just couldn't keep her safe. And she said this, I mean, I think she had liberties that a lot of kids didn't have. And I don't think her mom could have kept tabs on her and her dad was too drunk to keep tabs on her. But she said, quote, I went to a friend's boyfriend's house while my mom was busy. Um, the boyfriend's older brother would teach me backgammon, which led into a back massage, which led into rape, which led into her first heterosexual sexual experience. And he was 25 years old and this happened when she was 12. So she said she couldn't tell her mom um, because she felt that her mom was already carrying too heavy of a burden and she didn't want to emotionally burden her mom or make her mom feel bad. So she just turned towards her love of animals and nature. And she said that, quote, until she had her own children, animals became her only friends. And she, she vowed to protect the animals and only them. Gemini's, Gemini risings, Gemini moons, Gemini suns, heavy Geminis learn to not cry. That's why I asked, are you a Gemini that cries? Tell me, leave me a comment. How you'll know, if, you're, if the Gemini in your chart is has a lot of squares to it, hard aspects, um, this is probably going to show up a little stronger in your life. Not all Geminis feel this, but a lot of Geminis, Gemini risings can eventually feel alienated from their parents, just totally cut off. And they can oftentimes grow up to eventually see that opportunities and variety often ironically lead to a life that is very, very limiting in an ironic way. Because when there's so many options, right, you can be overexposed like Pamela, and you can grow up too fast like Drew, and you can sometimes get paralyzed by having opportunities and you don't know which opportunity is the best for you because there's no guidance. All these options and curiosities can leave, lead a Gemini to analysis paralysis. And this is a really serious thing for Geminis. Tell me if you feel this, where they get frozen, not being able to make a decision. So they end up not making one, only standing in place, trying to figure out what to do, what to do, what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I just have to research it a little more. I have to think about it a little bit more. I have to like analyze it a little bit more. One more day. Let me think about it. Let me, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And they go in circles, never going anywhere right? Never developing themselves, never really getting in touch with their emotions because emotions are not safe necessarily in a Gemini's world. And all of this can make a Gemini completely lose their identity or actually never even build one. In older years, Gemini risings can literally have just a full blown identity crisis around who am I? I don't even know who I am. Yeah. And Gemini's rising, Gemini risings end up in a very, they, they usually end up with really mentally smart people, sophisticated learners, sophisticated thoughts. Um, high academia usually runs in their family or in the background or the foreground, like Sandra Bullock's grandfather, the rocket scientist. The dad, you know, is often filled with just this giant, robust wit and sarcasm and a sense of humor and a playfulness. And he's funny and, um, you know. He, he also has kind of an acerbic sense of humor, a very mercurial sense of humor, where he can kind of like have zingers or jabs or kind of like put people down. Yeah, that's Gemini. They can really be kind of like cutting a little bit because their wit is so friggin' fast. Um, they can be kind of like funny mean, mean funny. Yeah. Um, think of like how a Scorpio might tell a joke. Gemini's like that, but a usually a little faster, faster zingers. And the child can be raised to be intellectual and smart and data-driven and they get the message that knowledge and school and networking and intellect is 
is um, important and they are pushed to become mental achievers in their life because that is what success is, the mind, yeah. And the child is often invested in and builds their confidence in the mental acumen and agility and gymnastics that they learn how to mimic and they learn how to do. Expressions of love are withheld and, and they can actually even be non-existent. So eventually a lot of Geminis and Gemini risings end up rejecting their families or their fathers especially in fear of not living up to their intellectual expectations of them. And sometimes it's the mother, but it's usually it's usually the authority person in the family. And they, they end up leaving the home quite early. And sometimes that's why they sink into other cultures that they feel will accept them even more than their own culture. They end up going into the world to find brand new mentors, new authority figures to put them on their eventual destined path. People who will accept them. I really want you guys to go watch my Gemini Venus video. I really want you to watch my everything Gemini video and how to make a Gemini fall in love with you. Those are really good videos on my channel. So that's your homework, Geminis, um, to binge watch some of those videos and um, to also do anything that gets you in your heart, gets you feeling passionate. Do anything that maybe even is like a little less uh, smart and a little bit more joyful or fun or playful that creates emotional attachment. I would say Gemini's destiny or destined path in life is to explore life with grand curiosity and open-mindedness, coming to understand the complexity of life and all of the complexity inside life to share and to learn from others in a way that like leads them endlessly into the next chapter and then the next and the next and the next.